Okay, dear friends, uh, it's time to start our session. Uh, this is uh, welcome to the uh, launch webinar of the 2021 Production Gap Report. Um, my name is Nicholas Hagleberg. I'm the coordinator for UNEP's Climate Change Program. And uh, I have the honor of opening this session today and also thank all the colleagues that have done a hard work for getting this report uh, launched yesterday. And um, over the last 24 months, there's been a heavy focus on countries putting, designing and putting forward nationally determined contributions and long-term strategies. But what you will hear today is that we need to look deeper beyond these NDCs and long-term strategies into sectoral strategies and also how countries allocate their finance so that uh, not only our ambition, climate ambition is aligned with the Paris uh, Agreement, but also what we do at the sectoral level. And we also need to elevate the NDCs to a level where, where, uh, where it guides not only the sectoral uh, strategies, but also how we put uh, forward public funding and how we finance our work. And before I give over to our moderator, Annika Flensberg, I would like to thank all the authors and the Stockholm Environment Institute, IISD, uh, E3G, and uh, all UNEP colleagues that have put in a year of effort into getting this report in front of us. So a huge thank you for all your time and commitment and, uh, and effort that you have put into this uh, report. Uh, Annika, now I would like to hand over to you. Thank you so much, Niklas. And thank you all for joining. It's great to see such a, a big interest in this very timely and important report 2021 production gap report, uh, government's fossil fuel production plans remain dangerously out of sync uh, with Paris agreements limits. And today you get the chance to um, learn more about the findings. And we will go through the main chapters of the report with the authors. And then uh, we will have a, reflect, a reflection uh, we're very happy to have Andrea Guerrero uh, Garcia here from the United Nations Secretary General's Climate Action Team, who will give some reflections and thoughts about the report. And after that, we will open up for questions. Or so, please, and we will use the Q and A box uh, that you will find in the below. There, you will see it, uh, where you can write your questions, and we will try to address as many as we can during this time. And, uh, but I won't say so much more than this. I think we'll get started and get into the content. And um, we'll start with chapter two uh, uh, of the report, looking at the actual production gap, explaining that and, and what it means. And uh, we have with us one of the authors of the chapter, Peter e Pete Eriksson from Stockholm Environment Institute, a senior scientist and who, worked on these topics for a long time. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Pete, to explain the gap. Wonderful, good morning from Seattle, where it is early morning. And I'm gonna tell you about chapter two, that is the calculation of the production gap. So I think we can go right to the next slide. First, what is the production gap? <laughs> the production gap is the discrepancy between, on one hand, the global levels of fossil fuel production that are implied um, by government's plans and projections, what they're, what they're calling for in their own government documents. So that's on one hand. And on the other hand is what are the levels that are consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals? So those, the difference between those two numbers is the production gap. And that's what we calculate. So there are two major inputs to that. Um, and I'll tell you what each of them is. So the first is basically from the, well, one is the, from the science, the levels of fossil fuel production that are consistent with 1.5 or two degrees C 
if you followed our past reports on this, uh, this calculation this year hasn't changed. And that's because it comes from the IPC scenarios from the special report on 1.5 degrees. Those scenarios have not been updated, at least not publicly. The AR6, the sixth assessment report scenarios are not yet available. So our calculation here is still based on the SR 1.5 degree scenarios. And what we do is, is we gather all of the scenarios for either 1.5 um, or two degrees, and we apply some additional screens, really just one essential conceptual additional screen to that. And that is that we remove the scenarios that rely on levels of negative emissions in the middle part of this century that are so high as to be broadly considered to be infeasible. So that's things like um, bioenergy with CCS, VEX. We removed some of the scenarios that have really high levels of that, for example. Um, and then we take the, the median of the results. So we don't pick any particular scenario. We take the median of the results of either that 1.5 or that two degree scenario set. So that's one of the data inputs. The other data inputs is what we call, um, and it's on screen here as the red line, uh, what we call the country production plans and projections pathway. And this is the level of fossil fuel production implied by government's plans and projections. So these are the government documents often done by an energy ministry um, that are publicly available that we could identify and that, that project or forecast what each country's fossil fuel production, coal, oil, and gas is going to be. So I'm in the United States here. That means that we look to the United States Department of Energy's annual energy outlook and their reference case. Um, just to the north in Canada, we would look at the Canada Energy Regulators Energy Futures Study and pick, actually this year, it's their evolving scenario, which they hold up as their central scenario. So we do this for 15 countries and we add it all up. And that is, those 15 countries represent about three quarters, 75% of uh, global fossil fuel production. And so, you know, we then need to do a little bit of scaling to get up to the total based on the share that those countries represent in the total um, global fossil fuel production. So there's the other number. And then the difference between those two is as you can see here with the black line labeled as the production gap. There's also another line, it's sort of gold or, or brown. And that is the fossil fuel production implied by countries' climate pledges and, and policies. And that comes from uh, almost directly from the IEA's stated policy scenario. So when we do this chart like this, that's all fossil fuel production, uh, we, we have to add the fossil fuel together in one unit. And that unit is basically the carbon content of those fossil fuels. We could do it in different units. Um, another choice would be to do it in energy-based units. Um, and we do use energy-based units for the individual fuels, but when we aggregate fossil fuel production together, um, we do it in carbon terms, since it is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is what causes climate change. Um, but we are assessing production, not we're not making a forecast of emissions per se, we're making a, um, an assessment of what fossil fuel production countries are planning on and we're denominating that in carbon terms. Okay, so what did we find? Next slide, please. Okay, so like we found in the last time in previous reports, governments are still planning on producing more than double the fossil fuels in 2030 than would be consistent with 1.5 degrees and about 45% more than would be consistent with two degrees. Let's pause and sort of reflect on that for a moment. But one way to interpret what this means is that countries have not yet done the work of translating what their climate pledges mean for fossil fuel markets. And then from there, what those changes to markets would mean for their own fossil fuel production plans. And this is kind of true in in two senses, really. You know, countries haven't yet aligned their fossil fuel production targets with 1.5 or, or two degrees. Um, that's the headline finding as you see here. But 
there's sort of a, a, a subtler point too, and that's that, that they haven't aligned their fossil fuel productions, even with the fairly modest concrete steps that they have taken to reduce the, their emissions. Um, that's the comparison of the red and the, and the goldish line. So this means in a sense that th this latter difference means that each country thinks that they will be able to outcompete other countries to produce those final barrels of oil, for example. Speaking of oil, let's go to the next slide. So, you know, the overall production gap is very interesting, but what I find most useful about uh, our analysis is the gap by fuel here. And that's because coal, oil, and gas um, have distinct markets and uses. And when you look at these results by fuel, and in physical and energy units here that the energy ministries and national governments use themselves, in my mind, that can start to become a bit more actionable. So governments or other actors can use this type of information, these low carbon pathways for coal, oil, and gas um, to begin aligning their own fossil fuel production outlooks with climate limits. I encourage you to read the, um, go into the details in the report on this, but I'm gonna keep moving because there's another, to the next slide, there's another really important thing that we did this year for the first time. And that, that is we did some sensitivity and robustness analysis um, of our results. We tested our findings against different mitigation pathways, not just the median of the IPCC scenarios, but we used the illustrative scenarios that are in the SR 1.5 degree report to look at different possible outcomes. And this can be useful because it's, it's possible that individual scenarios are more plausible than those sort of median uh, Franken scenarios that we use as, as the basis. So difficult to do this section justice in a short presentation. I really encourage you to look at the report, but the main finding is that even under the implausibly high uh, levels of negative emissions that are in, um, as you see here, the P4 scenario, in this chart on the, on the left, uh, there's still a production gap, right? So even if you're wildly optimistic about uh, carbon dioxide removal, CDR, like the P4 scenario is, fossil fuel use and production still needs to start declining now. And a related finding is that because even our median results include a large amount of CDR, right? We, we filtered out some of the most egregious um, scenarios, including P4, we filtered out. But even though our median results still include a large amount of CDR, um, or sorry, because they still included a, a large amount of CDR, our findings on the production gap are conservative in the sense that um, if CDR doesn't develop it at scale, the production gap would be even larger and governments would need to take a precautionary approach to the, well, if governments take a precautionary approach to the negative emissions, they should wind down fossil fuel production even faster than in um, and than our central findings would suggest. So uh, lastly, a point about methane, because lots of talk about fossil fuel production focuses on making fossil fuels less polluting um, at the production side, and that's often about methane. Uh, in this lower right chart on the screen, all of the illustrative IPCC scenarios that we looked at already build in massive sort of extraordinary reductions in methane release. And that means that um, more aggressive efforts to make fossil fuel production less polluting are not a substitute for winding down fossil fuel production and use because none of those scenarios leave any methane reduction opportunities on the table. Efforts to make fossil fuel production less polluting are, are critical, um, but those don't replace the need to get off fossil fuels. So that's chapter two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, and uh, uh, just before we hand over to go to chapter three, I would just also like to say that, uh, mention that this is the third edition of the production gap. The first report came out in 2019. And I should also mention the partners, of course, behind the report. It's modeled after the emission gap report and it's uh, produced by United Nations Environment Program, Stockholm Environment uh, Institute, International Institute for Sustainable Development, ODI, and E3G. 
and there has been over 40 researchers involved in the report. So it's uh, a lot of work that have been put into uh, this uh, report. But having said that, I will hand over to one of the other authors uh, who has uh, written the chapter three about government's support and policies for fossil fuel production. And Lucille Dufour, uh, Senior uh, Policy Advisor at International Institute for uh, uh, Sustainable Development. Uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Annika. And yes, let me uh, present the chapter three, which is about government support. And um, in this chapter, we really look at how uh, public support influences the production gap. Uh, we review two main things. The first one is the way in which uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shaped public support for fossil fuels. And the second one is really the mixed trends and signals that we can see uh, in terms of shifting public support away from fossil fuel production. We look at two main uh, type of mechanisms in the chapter. The first one are really national uh, mechanisms, including COVID-19 national response, uh, pre-existing fossil fuel subsidies, and also uh, support channels through uh, state-owned enterprises. And we also look at uh, multilateral and bilateral finance. And I will go into these two types of uh, main key supports uh, in my next slide and explain the, explain the, the key findings that we find. So um, next slide, please. Thanks. So let's start with the national support mechanisms. And uh, here, obviously, the first thing that we really wanted to look into in the report is the COVID-19 response provided by governments uh, since the beginning of the, the pandemic. Uh, we have analyzed uh, a lot of uh, different tracking initiatives that look at the recovery responses and the way they impact uh, the environment and climate. Um, and we have found that uh, different, these different tracking initiatives have uh, findings that are broadly aligned and that stress the fact that actually there is still a huge mismatch between government's commitments to build back better and the policies that have been um, adopted in terms of COVID-19 response since the beginning of, beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, now, if we really want to focus on uh, energy consuming and producing sectors, um, the data from the energy policy tracker shows us that since the beginning of the pandemic, government have provided more public funds for fossil fuel than clean energy through their COVID-19 response. Uh, if we take the G20, for instance, uh, countries have uh, provided more than $300 billion uh, for fossil fuel intensive activities since the beginning of the pandemic. And obviously it creates huge risks of uh, locking economies into high carbon pathways for uh, the, the decades to come. Um, what we've seen as well is that um, we have seen a slight greening of policies at the, uh, at the end of, of 2020. And this is what you can see on the chart on the right uh, hand of the slide. Uh, this is the green area. Uh, however, this greening has been uh, insufficient to tip the balance from fossil to clean. And you can see also on the chart that actually fossil fuel spending still uh, represents a, a majority of spending uh, overall in terms of COVID-19 response. So here's still a lot of progress to make to align this, this recovery with uh, you know, the shift away from uh, supporting fossil fuels. Um, the chapter three also look at pre-existing uh, fossil fuel subsidies and we look specifically in uh, fossil fuel subsidies that support the production of fossil fuels. And here we find that uh, these type of support are on the rise. Uh, they reached about $53 billion in 2019, according to the OECD. And it's obviously in sharp contrast with commitments that have been taken by groups of countries such as the G7 and the G20. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So let's turn, let's turn to uh, state-owned enterprises now. Um, and we look specifically um, at this kind of, of um, um, companies because uh, they have a big influence on the evolution of the, the production gap. And this is uh, for two key reasons. The first one is that the um, national coal, oil and gas companies control more than half of current global fossil fuel production. 
And uh, the second reason is that when it comes to national oil companies, they, are, they account for 40% of total investments in oil and gas worldwide. Um, so um, we have a, a bunch of support here uh, being channeled through state-owned enterprises. And what we uh, find in the report is that there could be some opportunities to uh, uh, shift this support uh, in, in state-owned enterprises. And this could be done done for instance uh, by um, some you know by the fact that governments uh, are able to reorient uh, or could be able to reorient some of the, the uh, strategic orientations and activities of these companies um, and also um, uh, one of the key opportunities uh, for SOEs is that they have easy access to finance. Um, However, what we find as well is that at the moment, uh, challenges are still more prominent when it comes to uh, shifting support uh, to SOEs away from fossil fuel production. Uh, and actually, these type of companies have still the least comprehensive plans in terms of widening, out, widening down production. And they're also planning to invest when it comes to national oil company. Uh, more than two trillions into oil and gas in the next decade. So we can see here that there is a huge risk that these kind of companies will be key contributors to the production gap in the following years. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're going to do now is turn to uh, international uh, public finance, which is the last part of the chapter. Um, and we really focus on multilateral and bilateral finance. Uh, we first look at the scale of finance. And um, well, the overall picture is uh, quite concerning because since uh, the adoption of the Paris Agreement, we've seen that public finance institutions have provided more than $294 billion uh, to, to fossil fuels overseas. So that's the overall picture. However, when we look a bit uh, more specifically into um, support to fossil fuel production through extraction, transportation, and processing, we see see that there are um, early signals that could show an improvement uh, because this type of finance has decreased significantly since 2017. And you can see it on the chart on the, on the, on the left. Um, what the chart doesn't show though, is that there is uneven support between coal, oil and gas. And while we have seen a decrease in uh, coal finance, and that should continue given the uh, latest commitments, for instance, from China and the G7, um, there, is, there has been an increase, a steady increase in gas finance, um, which could create a dash uh, for gas in the global south in the coming uh, in the coming years. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Last point that I wanted to mention on the chapter is that we also looked into the exclusion policies of, of, uh, that, are be, that have been adopted by some of the multilateral development banks and development finance institutions. And the good news here is that there are a grow, growing number of these kind of institutions that have adopted exclusion uh, of, for the production of fossil fuels. Um, However, uh, these MTVs and DFIs are still not representing a majority of assets uh, in all the MTVs and DFIs that we um, uh, analyzed. So it means that there is still a huge room of, of improvement. And when it comes to other type of public finance institutions, for instance, export credit agencies, there is even more progress to be made to really take into consideration the kind of exclusion policies uh, that would be necessary. Um, so, in a nutshell, really mixed trends in that chapter about su support. We see some positive early signals coming from uh, international public finance, but these uh, efforts and, and early signals need to be deepened to align with uh, the Paris Agreement goals. And most generally, when we look at both national and international support, we really see that a much more uh, faster and proven profound change is needed to really enable uh, a managed phase out of, of um, public, finance, uh, public finance and fossil fuel production. Thank you so much, Lucille, for that presentation. And uh, we'll move into uh, chapter four. Uh, and the, this year's report profiles 15 countries and that, that are presented in chapter four. Uh, fossil fuel production in poli and policies in key countries. And I hand over to Mikel Munoz Cabré, a senior scientist at Stockholm Environment Institute, to give you some insights uh, into these countries. Thank you, Annika. Um, 
So this chapter is for those of you, so far we have heard from, we have heard from Lucille and from Peter, we have heard about the global view. Now we're gonna go into the national approach. Next slide, please. So this chapter is for those of you who are interested in one or more particular countries. So one of the content of the report is we have produced these uh, country profiles for 15 specific countries, the major fossil fuel producing countries. And these profiles, they provide an overview of, of their climate ambitions, of their fossil fuel production plans and views on policies. We also have like an introductory section where we produce, pro provide some data such as extraction, extraction based CO2 emissions and uh, indicators such as their rank in production and their share of global production for the different fossil fuels, as well as their dependence on economic capacity for transition. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the key findings of this chapter and chapter three, but also of the report along with the gap is that like Pete said, most oil and gas producer countries are planning on increasing production up to 2030 and beyond some. And several major coal producing countries are also planning to increase production or to, or to keep production. In this chart, we, we juxtapose on one hand to the left, you can see their pledges for the national, uh, the net zero pledges that countries have made. So we find that seven of the 15 major fossil fuel producing countries have pledges for net zero emissions. And on the right side, right side of the table, we show how these uh, pledges do not yet translate into any meaningful plans for reducing oil and gas production. And in the case of coal, many of them are still planning on maintaining or increasing. Now, these numbers that you see on the right, uh, these arrows, these, they represent the increase uh, by 2030 relative to 2019 production levels. But in the country profiles, we do have much more detailed information. Next slide, please. So for each country, okay. So for each country, we have provided a detailed graph showing both the historical production, that's the blue line in the graph, and then the projections or the plans as found in their official uh, documents, national documents. So this is a summary of all the charts for all the countries. Uh, I'm not intending to go in detail or, or, or to even have you be able to, to see it in detail, but it's more so you know that what we have in there. So these are very detailed, a lot of work went into this. And uh, in some cases, the projections are more than one, which is reflected here with different and all the information can be found in the profiles. Next slide, please. So what is in the profile? So we have the data on their production plans, very detailed for each single profile. Here's an example. We have much more, and these profiles are really packed with information. So I really invite you, if you're interested in a particular country or more, I really invite you to look them because there's so much. So the first thing we consider, uh, they all follow the same structure. So it's more or less comparable among countries, at least in, in intent. So the first uh, section, we look at the announced climate uh, ambitions. And this is uh, mostly reflecting what is in the country NDCs, nationally determined contributions, but as well if they have a Z, Z zero, net zero pledges or other climate commitments. We, we take those commitments at face value. We do not analyze what they mean or whether they are ambitious or not. In the next section, in each, each uh, country profile, we have uh, what are the government views on fossil fuel production going up for moving forward? And we take these either from, from policies that, uh, that state that or from uh, official statements from heads of state or the relevant ministers. The next section details the plans and projections and basically where, what are the sources and where do we take the information that is reflected in the graphs that I showed you before. We also have a section quite, a, quite detailed on policies, uh, sorry, on government support for fossil fuel production. And here we include subsidies, but we also include other forms of financial support, the COVID recovery packages, policy exemptions, specific policies and other measures. And it, this is very specific to each country. And this year we include for the first time two new sections. And one of them is what are the policies and discourses towards managed wind down of fossil fuel production that countries may have? And the other one, uh, similarly, but not equally, is what policies and discourses supporting a just and equitable transition away from fossil fuel production. And so in one, we highlight the just and equitable dimension, in the other, we, we highlight the managed transition. And what we're looking here is what, are, what do countries have in place? And 
across the board, the findings is that countries do not have much yet as in fossil fuel producing countries. Uh, but we we expect and we hope that uh, as a transition the scatter scheme, this uh, section uh, will will have more in the future. So this is in a nutshell what we have in the country profiles in chapter four. Uh, as I said, they're really really dense information. So I look forward to the Q and A, or if you have any other specific questions, uh, we'd be very happy to discuss. And I give it back to you, Annika. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Uh, and we'll move into then chapter five, and that's the last chapter that we will present here today. And it's about the critical role of transparency in addressing the production gap. And uh, uh, it, I'm really happy to, to invite Harry von Asselt from the University of Eastern Finland, uh, prof professor of climate law and policy. So Harry, please, um, uh, I'll, uh, tell us about the, the importance of the transparency. Right. Thank you, Anne, again. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, so indeed, I'm going to be talking uh, briefly about transparency. And in the area of transparency, there's this saying that goes around, which is now maybe about 100 years old, that sunshine is the best uh, disinfectant. And I think that saying also holds true in the context of fossil fuel production. Next slide, please. So why should we care about transparency? There are several reasons. And this is, of course, well known for those of you who have studied transparency in other issue areas. At the national level, transparency can improve climate and energy policy making by helping policymakers to better understand the scope of the problem, like the environmental, the social impacts of a problem, but also by encouraging more inclusive and more participatory decision making and ultimately strengthening the means of holding governments, as well as in this case, companies to account. Moreover, transparency can highlight inconsistencies between the country's climate policies, as well as its other policies that stimulate fossil fuel production, which of course is very important in the context of the production gap. Now at the international level, transparency can also allow for the identification of who's doing what, who's lagging behind and who actually may need support in, in the transition. So transparency can further facilitate learning between countries, the sharing of best practices, and ultimately it can help to build trust and foster international cooperation. And this is why one of our key conclusions is that verifiable and comparable information on fossil fuel production, as well as on the support provided, plays a very important role, a crucial role in helping to address the production gap. Next slide, please. Now, the importance of transparency, which I tried to, uh, to highlight just now in the context of fossil fuel production, is reflected by the fact that there are already quite a number of, of initiatives that have emerged in the, in the past decades that try to shine a light on various aspects related to fossil fuel production or the government support provided to fossil fuels. They include initiatives by international organizations such as the OECD, the International Energy Agency, uh, dedicated initiatives for the extractive sectors. So we can think of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative or Publish What You Pay, uh, initiative focused on financial support. So we have various trackers, including the, the uh, relatively recent energy policy tracker, as well as ultimately a number of industry-led initiatives. So through these initiatives, we know now that a growing amount of information is becoming available, but there's still a better need for, uh, for better uh, or a bigger need for better information, more comprehensive information to allow us to come with a more robust assessment of what exactly is the production gap, as well as very importantly, the options for closing the production gap. As most initiatives that I mentioned and that are depicted here, um, ultimately do not cover the climate dimensions of fossil fuel production. In addition to what I already mentioned, the relevant information that may be out there is spread across various inf initiatives. It's often not standardized or comparable, and the country coverage may not always be complete. And ultimately, a number of these initiatives are largely voluntary. So overall, the bigger point is that it's very challenging to assess progress on aligning fossil fuel production with climate goals, and also ultimately to identify the needs for a just and orderly transition away from fossil fuels. Next slide, please. So what can we do about the, the, the lack of good transparency? And maybe more specifically and more precisely, what can governments do about the lack of transparency? 
As a first step in our chapter, we suggest that governments should disclose their fossil fuel production plans and their policies in the national energy and climate plans. Now, perhaps the most important or the most well-known national energy and climate plans will be the nationally determined contributions uh, that are submitted to, under the Paris Agreement, um, as well as the long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies or LT-LEDs that parties are also uh, um, asked to or required to, to submit. So these, these NDCs and the, and the LT-LEDs provide a very clear opportunity in our view for parties to the Paris Agreement to communicate the relevant information on fossil fuel production plans and policies to other countries as well as other stakeholders. Now, what you see here in this figure is that to some extent this may already be happening by, uh, by a number of countries. But the figure what on the right that you see here, it includes the mentions of fossil fuel productions in, in these documents, so in the NDCs and in the LT-LEDs. However, at the same time, it should be noted that many of these references are to continued or even increased productions. And, and also the countries that have indicated that they will adopt measures to wind down fossil fuel production are uh, not, yet, uh, not yet the major fossil fuel producers. So there's some important notes to, to be added to that figure. Now, in addition to information about fossil fuel production plans, there's also an opportunity for governments to disclose information on their fossil fuel production infrastructure. And here it's, it's useful to, to note and, and, and to say that they can already build on a number of existing initiatives, such as the Global Energy Monitor, which are tracking such infrastructure across the world. So again, there's ample opportunity for, to, to move forward here. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to the disclosure of fossil fuel production plans and policies, uh, which is in our view of, of, the, of, of crucial importance, governments should also strengthen transparency in at least two other areas, which we discussed uh, briefly in, in our chapter. And the first of these is the improved reporting of public financial support provided to fossil fuels linking back to uh, what Lucille was, was talking about earlier. So this includes information on the financial support channeled through public financial institutions, such as the multilateral development banks or export credit agencies, but also the fiscal support that countries provide through fossil fuel production subsidies. Also in this area, we see that some progress has been made in terms of, of collecting information and, and government reporting, but at the same time, there are still important gaps. Ideally, here we argue that public finance institutions would share the total amounts of finance disaggregated by fossil fuels, by production stage, and ultimately also by type of financing mechanism. Then the other area <clears throat> in where we see governments playing a role is by the mandatory, for the mandatory disclosure of information by fossil fuel companies, which would in this case also include state-owned enterprises. And here progress has already been made through initiatives such as the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, but governments can go beyond that and require companies to disclose their spending, to disclose their project plans, their greenhouse gas emissions, and ultimately their overall climate-related financial risk that they're running. Now, governments can take all of the actions that we've been talking about on their own, but at the same time, there are also important opportunities for international cooperation in this area. And one way would be for governments to start working together through existing intergovernmental forums. And here I already gave the example of using uh, NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, or the Long-Term uh, Low Emission Development Plans for communicating inf information on production plans. But we can also look at other intergovernmental forums, such as the, the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. And here we know, for example, that countries are already being asked to report on, on fossil fuel subsidies under SDG target 12.C. And also here, uh, reporting can still improve. But then in, in addition to these intergovernmental forums, governments can also work through multi-stakeholder initiatives in the sector. And the, the EITI, so the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, is probably one of the, the best examples of, of, of this, where action on climate change could also be scaled up. But then lastly, and, and, and in addition to maybe some, some of the other options that, that uh, governments have, is that governments can consider the creation of a dedicated intergovernmental transparency arrangement that focuses specifically on bringing together information to help address the fossil fuel production gap in a harmonized and standardized manner. And that's all for chapter five from me. So back over to you, Annika. Uh, thank you very much, Haro. Uh, and thank you all for the presentation of the report, and we'll soon have the Q&A, but first I will uh, uh, turn to Andrea Guerrera 
Garcia uh, from the United Nations Secretary General's Climate Action Team and who has, uh, who's an expert on climate change and energy transition and has an extensive experience working with the development uh, countries, governments, with international organizations, and also climate negotiations under the uh, UNFCCC. Uh, so what would you say, listening to this and taking, um, uh, taking part of the, of the results here, of the research, what are your thoughts and reflections? What relevance does this report have on the international scene and also for developing countries? Thank you, Annika, um, and thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to thank the authors and all the scientists be behind this report and the science that it's based on. I, I do think this report is crucial. It shows the incompatibility between countries' fossil fuel extraction plans and the mitigation goals science tells us we must achieve. It's also a different type of report, and we've seen a lot of reports come out uh, recently. It lends a different perspective. Uh, so the UNFCCC mostly takes into account where fossil fuels are burnt, uh, where they're consumed, and it doesn't take into account that much where they're produced. And this report fills in that, um, that gap in information. And it shows us a disparity from our global plans, what we need to achieve, what all governments said we should achieve in the Paris Agreement of global uh, temperature rise limiting with what plans that countries are having in, in fossil fuel production. If you combine this with the IEA report, for example, and its analysis, uh, its conclusions that we should not be looking at uh, oil and gas um, expansion from now on. If you combine it with uh, the well-known science and the SG's calls for coal phase out by 2030 for developed countries, 2040 for uh, developing countries. Uh, if you take all that together, you start to see a very comprehensive picture of where we should go and that we're not there. And also, of course, a UN gap report released uh, recently as well. Um, so in this particular case, what we're seeing is that developing countries and developed countries that are fossil fuel produ produ producers are planning for uh, expansion that is incompatible with all of those collective goals. It makes me think a bit of uh, a company in the 90s planning its expansion on the production of floppy disks or film photography. And for, for the millennials trying to ask themselves what a floppy disk is, my answer is exactly. We, we can't just rely on selling and our, our economies growing on something that is going to be unsellable in the future. Um, so for developing countries in, in particular, whose economies are over-reliant on the production and export of fossil fuels, I think this needs to be a wake-up call and it needs to prompt very serious strategic discussions within governments of the future that they're planning uh, for their people, for uh, their labor forces that are dependent on fossil fuel uh, production for their regions, because many times it's whole regions that are very dependent on uh, the production of fossil fuels. On the other hand, if they take this warning signs, if they take these market signs, and they have these strategic discussions, I think there is time now to plan for a just transition, plan for economic diversification, plan for what sectors will bring the opportunities for these, these new generations uh, to work on something different, something that does have a future. And I, I think that's a crucial discussion that needs to be happening in governments right now. And the other discussion is how do we support these developing countries uh, that are fossil fuel producers to have those discussions, to diversify their economies because they can't do it alone. They're already, these developing countries that we're talking about uh, are already facing extreme economic impacts of price volatility in the fossil fuels they sell, COVID uh, recovery efforts. They are in many cases very much affected already by impacts of climate change and will be continued to be affected by them. So developing developed countries need to start supporting those efforts very urgently as well. And so I want to just leave those two um, calls, if you will, in, in people's minds, one of governments needing to have these discussions of uh, economic diversification, just transition, 
and to the support that developing countries need uh, for this and, and for their path forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for that reflection. And also, as you said, it's a wake up call for uh, governments to bring the, to have this discussion uh, based on this and also bringing in the developing countries perspective. And uh, I'm looking now at the Q&A and there is a question about looking at it. There is a lot of people around the world, millions of people who don't have electricity access. And that, have, uh, and that they have, there is a need for low cost energy. And it's vital for, for many for their development uh, in low income countries. And uh, can anyone comment on this, on the investment gap for low carbon energy sources and the wider implication for fossil fuel dependent developing economies? Uh, so we'll start off with that question. And uh, maybe you, Mikkel, can start Sorry, I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to let Lucille start on this one. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Lucy? Then I'll start, and Mikael, you can add if, if you want. So I'm not sure if we've, we've got um, uh, figures on the investment gap. We've got some figures from the, the UNDP on, on you know, the finance needed to uh, provide um, universal energy access, and we're uh, between 400 and 600 uh, billion dollars per year by uh, 2030. So uh, we can see that the finance requirements are, are huge, and obviously it includes both public and private finance. So uh, uh, all this money doesn't uh, need to come from from public uh, sources of finance, um, but I think what what this question um, underline uh, underlines is the really the urgent need to to shift actually the public finance away from fossil fuels and um, into clean energy. Um, I was saying in my presentation that uh, there was a, a steep increase in uh, gas public finance for gas, international public finance for gas in the past years, and actually this is the the type of finance that received uh, the most uh, international public finance uh, in the per period 2017 to 2019. And uh, even even uh, like four times as much uh, finance than wind and solar. So you see that here there is some kind of um, an even uh, engagement of public actors uh, in uh, fossil fuels uh, versus clean energy. So this shift needs to to happen much 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 more quickly. And uh, the good news is that actually the clean alternatives uh, in the global south um, are almost. Um, already all competitive in terms of the uh, energy uses uh, compared to fossil fuels. So this is this is the good news. Um, however, it, it will obviously require a lot more uh, efforts from uh, public finance sectors. Um, and in the context of um, fossil fuel dependent developing economies, then it also means it is also means investing uh, quite heavily, not only into clean energy deployment, uh, grid infrastructure, etc., but also uh, in into just transition to make sure that affected communities and workers are not uh, impacted too much. Thank you Thanks, so much. Lucy. Oh, yeah. Sorry, and may I add to this? Um, so Katie's question also was the, the energy access. And, and I just want to emphasize energy access, it's a shame that we are well into the 21st century and there's still these levels of lack of energy access. So it is a crucial problem that needs to be resolved. Now, having said that, it is a fallacy to say that more cheap electricity <laughs> Is from fossil fuels is needed to provide electrification. We all know, and I have been doing projects in Southern Devo Africa, the Latin community and other places with low electrification rates. We all know that when new coal power plants come online, they go to the productive centers, to the cities. They don't go to the rural dispersed areas where this energy access is needed. So that's a fallacy argument. I just want to call it for what it is. And then the other part of the argument, which is we need cheap electricity and the assumption that coal is a cheap electricity. Well, there's this counter argument that some developing countries are too poor to afford coal, coal because coal is already in many places not the cheapest technology. But not only that, the risk of financial losses because of stranded assets in the next decade, not, not, not in the far future, no, no, this decade, is too great for countries to bear. And, uh, and I just want to put that on the table uh, because we keep hearing this argument. And this argument is, is an argument that is used because of the 
of the trajectory, the past trajectory that was powered by fossil fuels, this needs to be recognized and that many developing countries, developed countries developed on the back of, the, of fossil fuels, but that trajectory is not no longer available for those developing countries that want to develop in coal. It just doesn't exist. It is fair and fair. I'm not going into the fairness of it, but it is not a path that is no longer available. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, and uh, we have another question here uh, asking, one of the key tools and the demand side is pricing greenhouse gas, gas emission. Uh, what are the key tools on the supply side besides targets and reporting? I turn to you, Pete, maybe you can start. Sure, thanks for that question. I think one of the meta points of the production gap report is that maybe the supply side and the demand side are not that different. You know, reducing um, supply reduces consumption, reducing demand reduces consumption, and they're intimately related. And, you know, re reducing demand is one of the best ways to reduce production. Uh, and it also has the effect of reducing prices, um, which can have other benefits. But, you know, there are specific uh, actions that can be taken on the supply side as well. And we discuss several of those in the report. I think it was last year's report or two years ago, we had a, a, a typology um, where we really, you know, clearly laid out sort of a typology of supply side actions. Maybe somebody can, you know, add more of that in the, in the chat if possible. But, you know, the, the biggest one is simply to plan for fossil fuel production. Um, you know, at the national government level, make it a priority to set those expectations with industry that fossil fuel production is going to be winding down rather than to continue to, as in the government plans that we reviewed, continue to booster, to, to boost those industries and, and maintain the illusion that, um, you know, each country can supply that last barrel of oil, for example. But of course, there are individual policies and tools that can be applied um, as well. And some you know, easy examples of those are removing fossil fuel subsidies. This is something, uh, fossil fuel producer subsidies, something that many governments have already committed to do. Um, and where th those subsidies specifically to fossil fuel production can speed up and accelerate um, investments in new production that are simply not needed. Um, if we're gonna meet Paris goals. Another is to focus on the, the new, the, the licensing process, the permitting process for new oil, gas and coal um, extraction facilities and infrastructure. So, um, you know, considering climate in those decisions would often mean not, uh, not going forward with investments in those, new, in those new fields. So those are a couple of examples, thanks. Thank you very much, Pete. And I'll take another question here, and it's for Haro. It's about the transparency. And it says it's not explicit in defining mandatory disclosure by fossil fuel companies of exposure to climate-related financial risk to include disclosure of climate-related litigation and legal li liability, as well as reputational risk related to cooperation involvement uh, involvement in climate disinformation campaigns and anti-climate climate lobbying. Do you consider such disclosures essential? Right. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Kathy, for that, uh, that that's a very good question. You're right. We do not go into too much detail spelling out what climate fan, climate related financial risks we're talking about in our chapter. Um, mainly for space reasons, uh, but also because we want to keep the focus largely uh, on, on uh, what governance should be doing. Um, at the same time, you raise an important question like, well, if we are talking about climate related financial risk for companies, what risks are we talking about? Um, I think to answer your basic question, um, is such disclosure essential? I think my answer would first uh, be from the shareholder perspective, absolutely. Right, this is the type of information that if you're uh, um, putting your money into a company, that's exactly what you want to know. Um, so in that sense, a disclosure of such information to at least the shareholders is, is crucial. But then the next question is, it, would it then also be crucial to disclose that information 
uh, under, a, under a mandatory reporting system uh, to governments, basically making it open, not just to your shareholders, but also to governments and, and potentially the wider public. And here, I guess one could also uh, make the argument that yes, also that is quite essential, um, given that, uh, well, first of all, you can actually try disclose information about, for example, what you refer to the disinformation campaigns, which is of course very important to know for the wider public, uh, to basically see whether they still have faith in a, in a particular company. Um, but likewise, also for investors in a company or people or, or governments that may be interested in supporting a company or not, for them, it can also be quite uh, important to have that information readily available. Um, so I guess my, my qualified answer is that absolutely for shareholders, this is crucial information. For governments, uh, like in, in terms of mandatory reporting, most likely it should be uh, included as well. Uh, thank you very much, Haro. Uh, uh, Haro. And there have come, uh, come and other questions here about instruments. And uh, I'll put that to maybe you, Lucille, first. And can instruments such as the EU's border tax adjustment impact on changing the trajectory of expanding fossil fuel production? Uh, could that be a tool? That's a broad question, uh, and I will not go into the details of the technicalities on that one. Um, it can be an interesting tool, obviously, and trade can, can uh, you know, uh, be a good, um, basically provide good adjustment tools to incentivize countries to take uh, more measures, both on the demand side and on the production side. Uh, the question, obviously, uh, for for the border adjustment tax um, and for all the other tools is how these kind of tools are designed and uh, whether they uh, support, you know, additional regulations, both uh, in the regions where they're put in place and in other countries. So I think that this is the key, um, the key questions that uh, we should ask ourselves when, when talking about the EU's border tax adjustment. Um, and, and, you know, whether they are the right uh, conditions that are put in place so that it has uh, the right incentives, especially in the, in the biggest, uh, largest fossil fuel producing countries. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to this. Um, Michael, I'll see you. Perfect. Sure. Thanks, Lucille. And I just want to add, um, this is maybe an area that future reports can elaborate on. In this report, in the production gap report, we do not look at how demand policies affect production. So this is basically you're saying uh, the EU border tax, that's demand policy, but we also have other examples like China's uh, announcement not to fund car power plants ab uh, abroad or Indonesia's uh, main utility pledging no, no, to go net zero. So we have not looked at how demand policies affect production. And this is an area where uh, we would like to work more in future editions. Thank you. Thank you, Mikel, for that clarification. And also, Haro, Haro, I think you had a comment as well. Yeah, well, I think Lucille and Mikel covered the most important points already um, in the sense that uh, what the EU is proposing, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is indeed not aimed at fossil fuel production as such, but it may have impacts down the line. So again, it's a demand side policy that may have an impl implications in fossil fuel production or on fossil fuel production in certain uh, countries and certain regions. Um, but I would expect that impact to be relatively limited if, at this stage. Um, a much more direct way of tackling fossil fuel production, but also a much more controversial way of tackling fossil fuel production would be uh, by trade restrictions on fossil fuel products. Mm -hmm. So if the EU would, for example, um, uh, ban LNG coming from uh, the United States, which again, is not going to happen anytime soon, um, but that would, of course, be a, a much more direct, uh, a direct way of tackling fossil fuel production. Um, so in that sense, that would, in my view, put, fall under the, the, the suite of measures that we can call supply side climate policies. Uh, but again, uh, before we look into these types of, of policies and uh, their feasibility and legality, etc., cetera, um, it's also important to keep in mind what Mikel uh, already said, is that demand side policies may also ultimately have these uh, hopefully wanted effects on fossil fuel production. Thank you very much. Uh, for that as well and we got uh, 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 one question also about carbon removals uh, 
uh, and the potential that are used in the in the report are equivalent to the upper level of the sustainable ranges that can be found in the uh, scientific literature. What are the hypotheses for carbon capture? Uh, and I'll turn to Pete, who talked about that also carbon capture in your presentation. Um, thanks for that. And just to clarify, um, the potential for um, BECs that we we, we, we used essentially um, climate action trackers assessment, which was in turn based on the IPCC's assessment. We went into the primary literature there to confirm. Nonetheless, we put a limit of 5 billion tons, 5 gigatons of CO2 removal um, per year in mid-century, which we defined as between 2040 and 2060. So we excluded scenarios that that basically had more than five gigatons of BECs in the mid-century, and that had more than 3.6, I think, billion tons, gigatons of uh, afforestation over that same time period. Uh, we didn't, we looked, first of all, neither Climate Action Tracker nor um, IPCC, to our knowledge, has summarized literature on upper limits for CCUS or DAC. And when we looked, DAC being director of capture, when we looked, we didn't yet see any of that ourselves, nor did we necessarily want to get into um, putting additional or other screens on besides um, what previous authors had done. So, I mean, it's a valid question. Um, I think there's some new literature out in, you know, just in the last few weeks, actually, that attempts to get at some of these upper level li limits for, for DAC. But we didn't apply that, nor frankly do the IPCC models that we relied on have all that much um, direct air capture uh, in them. The, 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 they generally use much more um, BECs, at least so far, or they use BECs as sort of a general stand-in for all negative emissions technologies. So um, it's, a bit, it's a bit tough to to get you know too specific or too prescriptive about what um, what is and isn't possible in that regard. Uh, thank you, Pete, for that. Um, we have a question here. I mean, there's a lot of engagement, of course, among people around the world when it comes to climate, and and we got a question here: what uh, what the best policies are for everyday citizens to push for. With, God, with regards to the transi transition away from fossil fuels. What role could central banks play in the transition, for example? Uh, and uh, I see here, uh, Mikkel, maybe you will, would like to start with this. Th thanks, Annika. Uh, and this really is two questions. So, and I'll take them both actually. So on the first one, what are the best parts for everyday citizens? I, I think it's important to acknowledge that fossil fuel production is driven, is a structural issue and is driven top down, not bottom up. So everyday citizens actions um, are like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis are not gonna make much of a difference. No, so what can citizens do? If you live in a country and we have to much here different political realities, but if you live in a country where you have influence over your government because you can either vote or protest or do any other means that you have influence, you can use this influence to pressure your governments to take this issue seriously. If you have decision power of over acquisition of capital goods that consume fossil fuels, be it a car or something, you can also make your choice uh, to go for the non-fossil fuel production as our non-fossil fuel consuming, so affect the demand, not the production, which in turn will eventually affect demand. But it's important to recognize this is a structural issue and we need top-down approaches. So political pressure is the most effective in this regard, as well as economic pressure. But I would like to specifically go on the second one, right? So what role central banks can play in the transition? And I mean, the obvious answer is regulation, but what kind of regulation we're talking about? So central banks, regulate financial liabilities from, from all the financial entities, what do they have to have in terms uh, to discharge their, their financial responsibilities? Well, do the same for carbon. So how do you translate the carbon liabilities into financial liabilities? Uh, require all the financial entities that are under your purvey, under your regulation, regulatory umbrella, require them 
uh, create rules that force them to have uh, to acknowledge and quantify and put in their balance books and provide reserves for to cover their carbon liabilities. That alone would be a huge step. So that would be my first thing. I'm sure others will add others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikkel. And I'm just uh, aware of the time here uh, that we don't, we don't have that much time left. And uh, uh, so uh, I would actually like to have a, a final question. And thank you so much for all the questions that you put in the chat. And please contact us outside of this, of this webinar if you have more questions. And uh, thank you for showing interest and participating. And thank you for all the, the present, presenters here today and the authors. Uh, and but I would like to ask one final question. And I put it to you, Pete, if you can make like the main conclusions of this year's report, how closing the production gap, what are the main conclusions from the report? What would you say? And also bearing in mind that we are getting close to COP here. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining uh, today. It's been a wonderful discussion. We hope to dig into the report, share it, talk about it. Um, so, as I understand your question, Annika, it's what will it take to close the production gap? We've heard a lot um, of talk about that. Haro in particular laid out a number of uh, strategies related to transparency. And, you know, as one who helped calculate the production gap, I want to give a, first a very liter literal answer <laughs> um, to what it takes to close the production gap. And that is quite simply for governments to align their fossil fuel production outlooks with the need to wind down fossil fuel consumption. Um, and this means no longer hoping to be that last producer standing, um, but instead take proactive steps as national governments to plan for and manage that decline in fossil fuel production. That is you know, the simplest answer to how to close the production gap, obviously that is not so simple in practice, but there are multiple benefits of doing just that, um, of, of planning for that wind down of fossil fuel production, not least of which is greater certainty for those communities that have long produced fossil fuels so that their transition is less of a sharp shock and more something that can be planned for um, in an equitable way. Another theme is to do this in cooperation with other countries. The, the global, the climate benefits of managing a wind down in fossil fuel production come largely from working together across countries um, so, that their, so that production and consumption can really be limited effectively. And one place to start in that, as we've heard time and time again this morning, is in the UNFCCC. Their countries can talk about fossil fuel production as part of their climate strategies, or rather limiting it as part of their climate strategies. They can start to do so in, the, in their nationally determined contributions, their NDCs, and in their long-term strategies. Um, and that would be a starting point. There are also other venues for cooperation. Um, many venues for cooperation and, uh, that could be adapted to fossil fuels. But just one to, to start with, it could be the Net Zero Producers Forum. And even though that is not yet focused on fossil fuel production, it, you know, they've mainly focused on, say, reducing methane emissions, which is important. Um, but could existing uh, organizations, institutions like the Net Zero Producers Forum expand their focus or be adapted um, to, to help manage that wind down and to explicitly align fossil fuel production outlooks with climate limits. Um, and, and to do so in a way where the high income countries, um, the higher income countries lead uh, the way in that wind down because they have gotten the lion's share of um, any wealth that there was to get from fossil fuels that makes sense for them to go first in moving us away. So I um, encourage you to look again at the much more richer uh, details on all of these topics in the report. And thanks to everyone again for joining us this morning.
Annika, I did, you, did you or others have final words to close this out? I can just remind everyone that Lindsay put the link uh, uh, the link in uh, to the report in the chat, and please take a, uh, a look at that. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know afterwards. And uh, thank you so much for joining today, and a huge thank you to you all uh, in the in the presenters. And uh, I don't know if no one else has anything else to say. We'll say. Um, goodbye and see you again, I hope. <laughs>